Welcome to another wonderful episode of Diaspora Link here exclusively on Ghana Web TV. I am your host, Diallo Sumbri, and we thank you for joining us this week. We have another exciting episode. I'm really thrilled about interviewing today's guest, Mr. Safiwe Baleka, who's come here all the way from Guinea-Bissau. I'm so happy that we've been able to catch him while he was in town. So let's get into it and learn a little bit more about Safiwe. So before we get into our interview with Mr. Safiwe Baleka, let's find out a little bit more about him. And as you know, we always start off with choices. So Safiwe, this is really simple. I'm going to give you two choices. You choose one and tell us why. Okay. Okay? Okay. All right. So since I know a little bit of something about you and your history, um, I'm, I might throw some of that in there. Okay. okay. All right. You ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, here we go. Ethiopia versus Guinea-Bissau. You Guinea -Bissau. can only choose one. Guinea-Bissau. Guinea-Bissau. Why Guinea-Bissau? One, that is my ancestral homeland. Okay. And two, I really love the people of Guinea-Bissau and how they have welcomed me. Got you. Next one. Ball head versus dreadlocks. <laughs> um, bald head. <laughs> Why? Um, my significant other likes that. Smart man. <laughs> Smart man. You better do what you like, bro. Yes. Okay. Next one. Um, all right. How about this? Ethiopian food versus palm nut soup. Ethiopian food. <laughs> Why Ethiopian food? Um, I, I really enjoy the injera and the shirawat and um, it's, you know, they have their own spices, their own unique thing. And that was the first food I had in Africa. Um, and it was, it's natural, it's real, it's fresh. I love all the African food. Um, but me, I'm partial to Ethiopian food. In fact, after this interview, we're going to go get some Ethiopian I'm food. The, I'm going to the Ethiopian restaurant in Ghana. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. How about this? I'm going to move the sports a little bit. Okay. Basketball or football? Basketball or football? Yeah. Well, of course, I'm going to say swimming, but... Um, I didn't say swimming. Yeah, I know. I know. That's why I didn't so, make him one of the So swimming. for me, I would say football. Football. American yes. football. Why yes. football over basketball? Um, I... I wanted to be a football player when I was young, and I did play football um, in high school. I played basketball, too, and uh, I was better at football. Okay. Because you played football, and you were better at it. Yeah. All right, how about this? Some good old, nice, down south cooked macaroni and cheese versus jollof rice. A jollof rice. Jollof rice over mac and cheese. Why well, yes. Um, I think it's healthier <laughs> on the one hand. <laughs> um, uh, and if they put nice flavors and spices in it, I'm all for that because I like spicy food. And okay. with the jollof rice, you can put all kinds of sauces on it. Okay, and so it's more diverse. Yeah. All right, got it. Ladies and gentlemen, choices. One of the things we know about choices is that we make them every day. We make choices every day even without thinking about the choices that we make. But we should always learn to respect each other's choices. If we respect each other's choices, we'll get along a lot better in this world. So, always remember, choices should bring us closer together and not divide us further apart. So now that we've gotten to know a little bit more about our guest, Mr. Safiwe Baleka, let's get into the interview. Safiwe. Yes. Once again, I'm very happy to have you here. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. This is great. So... Um, you're not from Ghana, right? Um, but what brings you to Ghana? So actually I came to represent Guinea-Bissau in the 14th African Swimming Championships. This 14th African Swimming Championships? Yes. It'd be so much stuff happening in Ghana. You don't even know that this type of thing is happening unless you meet somebody like you. Yes, so this was the biggest competition, swimming competition for the continent that they have every two years. Okay. <clears throat> in every two years, is it hosted in another country on, in, on African continent? Yeah, it can, it can change um, different places. And two years from now, the 
all African games, it will be here in Ghana as well. So. Okay, so all African games, is that like an African Olympics? Yes. Well, I'm ignorant. I need to, I'm going to look that up. <laughs> I'm going to look up the all African games. All right, so now I heard you say that you were representing Guinea-Bissau. Yes. Okay, so because I know you in real life, I know why and how, but we're going to get back to that. We're not going <laughs> to. So let's talk about where you're from. Where, where are you from? Where were you born? So I was born and raised um, outside the city of Chicago in okay. the United States. Shy town in the house. Yes. Shy town in the field. What's up, Shy town? <laughs> Thank you for showing me love every time I visited there. Okay, so you were born in Chicago, born and raised. Born and raised suburbs of Chicago. Actually, okay. Aurora, Illinois. Which Aurora, is, Illinois, yeah. which is close enough to Chicago for you to say Chicago. Exactly. No, nobody from Chicago is going to get mad that you're from Aurora and say Chicago. So. Okay, they're cool with it. So your family, everybody was from Chicago. Yes. All right. And you went to school. And so tell us a little bit about your schooling and, you know, kind of how you moved around. So my father graduated from Fisk University, which is okay. a historical black HBCUs college. in the building. Shout out to Fisk. Yes. Shout out to W.B. Du Bois. Right? Yes, okay. exactly. All right. All right. Um, I know a little something. And my father had a degree in mathematics. And so um, in those 1960s um, period, 1970s, um, he was part of that generation that had an opportunity to get a good job and mm -hmm, move out mm -hmm. to these suburbs. We were actually the f second African-American family to move into an all-white neighborhood. Wow. So Aurora was all-white. Yes. Much. Well, the, the, the place where, where I was raised called mm -hmm. Oswego, Illinois, mm -hmm. all-white. Mm -hmm. um, so I was raised there. I went you know, all the way to school, high school, graduated. Um, and now, hold on. What was that? What, what was that like? Because it wasn't, you know, I'm not dating you, but it wasn't the 90s <laughs> or the 80s. So what was that like in a place like Chicago, outside of Chicago at that time, being one of the only black families in an all white neighborhood? Was it, was it a progressive white neighborhood? So, OK, so I was born in 1971. I will date myself. OK, no okay. problem. Um, and at that time, I would say it was a progressive white neighborhood, but you have to understand, you know, I didn't see anyone that looked like me, mm. okay? And going through school, you know, I remember when Roots came out and I saw that, and for me as a young boy at the time, I felt a lot of shame. Like, why do I have to be part of the, the losing team, the mm -hmm. team that was enslaved? The, you know, I felt a lot of sh shame, and um, there was sort of this inferiority complex. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you know, I was a good athlete. Okay. And, you know, in America. All sports. All sports. I played everything. You played everything. Okay. And I dominated everything, too. Okay. 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 That, that makes a difference. Yes, it does, <laughs> because in America, that's a big deal, and... Because, because of that, um, I was accepted and brought fame and glory to, to the town. Got you. So I was accepted. Um, in a different way. I in a different it. way. I get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, wow. Okay. So you grew up there, elementary school, middle school, high school. Yes. Now it's time to go to college. Yes. And? So at that time, you know, I was one of the fat, ten, you know, I was top 10 swimmer. I was one of the fastest swimmers in the country. Okay. Um, and I was fortunate was enough. Was there a p particular swim meet? What is it called in swimming? It's this is a, they're called meets. Swim okay. Meets. Yeah. So was it like? So you have you have nationals, you have junior nationals, okay. you have all these things, and um, so I was ranked in the top ten. I was okay. one of the fastest okay. swimmer, high school swimmers in the country. So I had an opportunity. I was recruited by all the colleges and universities and. You know, I was fortunate enough I could go anywhere. Um, full scholarship. Full scholarship. But, you know. <laughs> you, did, did, you didn't go to Fisk. No, I didn't. <laughs> the, the, the historical black colleges, they, they didn't have swimming programs. Uh. And my goal was to make the Olympics. I wanted to be the first African-American on the U.S. Olympic swim team. Nice. And in order to do that, I needed to go somewhere where the swim program would allow me to do that. Mm-hmm. I ended up going to Yale University, which was a strange decision 
because it was actually the worst swim team in the Ivy League. And everyone was like, you could go anywhere. Why don't you go to a great swimming school? Why are you going mm -hmm, to this? Mm -hmm. um, the coach at Yale had a reputation for getting underdogs onto the Olympic swim okay. team. Okay. Um, so one reason was because of the coach, but the other reason was I had this strange out-of-body experience where I felt the ancestors were telling me, this is where you need to go. Hmm. Um, so now, I ended up going to Yale. Let me, let me stop you real mm -hmm. quick. Did you have this out-of-body experience at the time where you was like, okay, this is the ancestors, or in retrospect, looking back, were you like, okay, that was the ancestors telling me? No, it, was, it happened at the time, and okay. it was very vivid, very clear. It was, some people might call it revelation. So, I mean, it was, I knew instantly at the moment mm -hmm. that I was going to make that decision, and it didn't matter that it was crazy or it would seem crazy to anybody else. It was, it was crystal clear to me that the ancestors are saying, this is where you need to go. And in four years... Um, I led that team from being the worst team in the league mm. to Ivy League champions. Wow. So you became champion in your last year or yes. your third year? In the, in, the, in the fourth year. Okay. So My you moved year. up each year? Yes, each year we wow. moved up and became champions. I mean, that's a big deal. Yale is a prestigious institution. Yale is considered to be one of the best, or at least Ivy League schools in, in the U.S. It was expensive. Yes. Um, your <laughs> father expensive. didn't have to pay, so I'm sure he was... No, he didn't have to pay. See, so Ivy he, League schools don't give athletic scholarships. So, so wait a minute. <laughs> Did you have you gone back to thank your father? Yes, because, I have. Yes, I have. Because you can go full scholarship to anywhere, and you chose to go to a school where your your dad still had to pay. Well, my father, to his credit, you know, he said, "Listen, this is your life. It's your decision. This is the first major decision you're going to make as an adult." He said, "Wherever you want to go to school, right? That's your decision, and I will help you help you to do that." And nice. so, tr true to his word, I. You know, explain to him, this is where I want to go, and, oh, yeah, and he honest. helped me do it, yes. Wow. Okay, so from Yale, you, 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 you were a swimmer, heavy, heavily in the athletes. What happened after Yale? So my senior year at Yale, I had this identity crisis mm. where, you know, I started to realize, become racially conscious and mm -hmm. politically conscious and realized what Yale what kind of institution it was. It was a modern day plantation, if you will, education, mm -hmm. and had all of these conflicts and, um, and ended up leaving Yale two months before graduation um, to travel around the world. Wait a minute, sorry. <laughs> two months before graduation. Yes, two months before graduation. You had all the credits to graduate. Everything. You had finished. Yes. But you got your degree. I ended up coming back to get the, the, the degree, yes. I mean, but you didn't leave and have to go back and take classes again. You know, I did. Okay, let me, I got to hear this story. So, yes, I, I two, had... Two months before graduation, you leave? Yes. Okay. So, I started having conflicts with the administration. Mm -hmm. I started to become this free thinker. I had this political consciousness. I started challenging, you know, and having my own thoughts about what I was learning, um... And I started having conflicts with the administration, and I realized that Yale was no longer helping me, it was stifling me. I never mm -hmm. went there for the degree in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, you know, the, they were having strikes because Yale has this billion dollar endowment, but the people that run Yale and take care of Yale, African American people, they weren't even being paid a living wage. Mm. So there were, you know, all of these strikes, and I sided with the, with the, with the unions and the strikers, and we had boycotted. And, and, and as a star athlete, yes. in your final year, yes. bringing all of this attention to Yale, yes. for you to side with the, the, the custodians and the unions and the workers, that was a big deal. Yes, it was mm. a very big deal. And um, I just had a change in my thinking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. why I was there and what I needed to do. And, you know, I was, I was a philosophy major, and I got tired of reading about Jesus and the Buddha and, you know, all of these spiritual luminaries. I wanted to be like them. So mm. um, I gave up everything. I just literally, three days after I led the team to the Ivy League championships, I left school. It just disappeared. <laughs> Yo, I'm just saying... 
I'm glad. So my son got a full scholarship, and I'm, I would have been happy for him to find himself in all of that. <laughs> but you need to finish school. <laughs> I would have been like, you need to finish school, champ. But go ahead. So, well, so no, it, where did you go? What did you do? So well, I left school. Um, I showed up. I went home. My father didn't know anything about this. Mm -hmm. I showed up. I said, Dad, listen, I love you. I just want to let you know, you know, I'm going to go travel around the world. Thank you. I love you. I don't know when I'm coming back, if ever. And then I left um, and didn't look back. And I traveled around the world for 15 years. I became a devout Rastafarian. Okay. Um, and that's when my, I developed this African consciousness. Um, Over the course of that 15 years. Yes. So, so you came to face to face with yourself, so to speak. Yes. Um, during your senior year in college at Yale. Yes. Now, because you were a star athlete, right, and you talked about being in Aurora, um, Illinois for, for most of your, your high school mm -hmm. and then going to Yale. These are both uh, majority white environments. Yes. Even though you were a star athlete, did you experience directly like any forms of racism that led you to kind of discovering this uh, African consciousness or did it just happen naturally? You know, when you're a star athlete, you get treated with a lot of respect and even though there's racism all around you um, and what they call microaggressions and all those things, mm -hmm. you don't suffer it the same way that if you're not a, gotcha. a, a star athlete, right? So there wasn't, I, I, there wasn't any particular moments. You know, I wasn't having run-ins with the police or anything like that. Okay. Those things happened afterwards. Mm -hmm. You know, after I started traveling and I came back with my dreadlocks and I was politically conscious, then I started suffering all those kinds of mm. um, racist experiences, but um, not at first. Wow. So, um, whew, two months from graduation? Yes. Man, that's, that, was a, that was some serious revelations. So I ended up, you know, I had vowed that I would never go back to Yale. But mm -hmm. in order to honor my father, I eventually, after I had traveled for about two, two and a half years. Okay. I did come back. And in order to honor my father, I did go back um, for one last semester and graduate and got my degree. Finished and got your degree. And, right? Okay. And then I left again um, to pursue this Pan-African duty that I felt. So in your travels during that 15 years, I'm assuming you've traveled, you traveled to some African countries. Yes. What, what were some of the other countries you went to visit? So the first place I went to was Ethiopia. Okay. And um, spent some time in Ethiopia. Spent some time in Ethiopia. I actually worked as a journalist um, okay. in Ethiopia, which allowed me to go to the African Union. Okay. Um, and I lived in Shashamani, which is the community where Rastafarians have repatriated because okay. of the land grant. Um, I came to Ghana. First time I came to Ghana was in 2007 for the African Union Grand Debate. Okay. Um, and I was a delegate there. So Ethiopia, Ghana, have you visited yep. any other? Uh, I've been to Benin, okay. Togo, Egypt, South Africa, and now I live in Guinea-Bissau. Okay. So what we're going to do right now, it feels like a good time to do it, is we are going to play Africa in 60. So, Safiwe. Okay. Africa in 60 is a game we play okay. where we want to see how many African countries our guests can name in 60 seconds. In 60 seconds, We wow. purposely don't tell you this in advance. Yes, I Because if see. we did, we know you'd be looking at the <laughs> map and studying. And we know everybody will be studying. So, okay. all right, do we have our timer set? We ready? We got our buzzer set? Okay. You ready? Yes. Okay, in three, two, one, let's go. Okay, let's see. Egypt, Sudan, Somalia, Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Lesotho, Namibia, Mozambique, um, Angola, um, Democratic Republic of Congo, Equatorial Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, um, Guinea-Conakry, Mali, Morocco, Algeria, Senegal, Gambia, um, Liberia, Sierra Leone, um, Chad. Uh, Good job. Uh, Keep going. You got some more time. Okay, I got some more time. Hold on. Um, Chad. Um, I said Mali, I think. Um, Mauritius. 
Okay. Um, uh, Cape Verde. Okay. Um, Time. Okay. Did you say Guinea Bissau? Yeah, I did say okay. Guinea Bissau. I want to make sure. Yeah, I did. I did say. Okay, it. I counted about twenty-five, which is good. It's is not it? bad. Okay. It's not bad. It's not okay, bad. Not it's bad. bad. It's not bad. So, Africa in sixty is all about making sure that we remember Africa's a continent, a huge continent with fifty-four nations, and in each nation there are different languages, there are different cultures. So let's just make sure that as we continue to talk about Africa. And as we continue to talk about the diaspora, that we remember that Africa is not this one monolithic thing. So no one speaks African, so to speak. All right. So we're going to take a break and we'll be right back after this break uh, with more with Safiwe. That's Africa in 60. So let's continue with us. So what do you think about Africa in 60? That's fun. That's fun, right? Yeah, it's you don't fun. think about it, right? You don't, because most of the time you think you know all of the country, <laughs> but that 60 seconds gives you that pressure. Now, this is not swimming. If we were swimming, you handle pressure well when you're swimming. <laughs> okay, so, so you traveled around the world for 15 years. You had developed this, um, this level of African consciousness. You became a Rastafarian. You moved to Ethiopia. You went to all of these other countries. You began working with the AU. Um, and then you decided to go back to Yale. Yeah and finish your degree. What was that experience like when you went back? It was very different. Okay. Um, first of all, I looked different. I had dreadlocks that were down to my shoulders. And um, I didn't know anyone there. Everyone that I knew had graduated and, and gone. This was like 15 years later? No, it wasn't 15. This was two and a half years later. Okay, two and a half years yeah, later. It okay. was in the okay. midst of that 15 years. Got you. Um, but, you know, I... I was living in an abandoned building because I, I didn't want my father to be paying any He did his part. So now I'm there as a, as a man on my own. And I was living in an abandoned building, squatting, you know, to make it through. Mm -hmm. And um, I started to have encounters with Yale um, security, New Haven police. Um, and at that time, though, um, New Haven, Connecticut, which is where Yale is, mm -hmm. um, they had um, a very strong Black Panther Party. Okay. And there were Black Panther Party members that still lived there that were now elders that sort of took me under their wing and I started to get sort of that mentorship, that training and, um, you know, your perspective changes once right. you become, you develop this level of consciousness. So my experience at Yale was very different. I went from just being totally focused on being a swimmer and trying to make the Olympics to now I'm politically involved in the community. Mm -hmm. And did you feel like you could maintain um, a commitment to being politically involved and still swim to reach the Olympics? Or did that change your perception no, about the Olympics? It, no, I was retired if, okay. from swimming at that point. You hadn't yeah. continued? You, I was done with swimming. But it was always your first love. I it mean, was, not first love, but swimming was, at that time, it was still something you loved to do. Yeah, swimming was, you know, I started competitive swimming at the age of eight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, yes, in a way, it was my first love. But w once I left Yale, after we won that Ivy League championship, I was, I was done. I didn't make the 92 Olympic swimming team. Okay. And I, I no longer had the heart or the spirit to tr try to again for another for four years. So I was, I was done with it. So you made your way around the world. And then eventually you made it back to the U.S., right? Yes. Okay. So when you got back to the U.S., what, what were you doing then? I was, you know, uh, an activist, um, doing activist type of things. Living involved, the activist life. Yeah, in a nonprofit, you know, working at various nonprofits and right, struggling right. to try to make ends meet. and. Um, but, but satisfied with the work you were doing. Absolutely. And it was worth it to have these personal struggles as long as you could continue to be committed to work to help your people. Yes, because that was the change in the mentality was that because of the opportunities, educational and others that I had, you know, I had read Marcus Garvey and he said people like me had to undergo what he called a racial re-education mm -hmm. if you wanted to be of use for your race. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I felt this tremendous responsibility to um, serve my people 
African-American people, black people, mm -hmm. African people, Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. I felt this duty to, to serve, and that was personally rewarding. Me, I was never interested in um, the, you know, making the money. Yes, we need money to live and those kind of things, but my goal wasn't to make m money and become right, right, right. rich. That wasn't, that wasn't your thing. Yeah, my right. thing was make a contribution to our struggle that my grandchildren and great-grandchildren would be proud of and say, oh, my father did this as part, mm -hmm. of, part of the struggle. Hold it right there. We'll be right back with Safiwe Baleka to talk more about not only where he's from, but where he is now and what he's doing. Peace, Global African Family. My name is Diallo Sumbri. I'm a co-architect of Ghana's Year of Return 2019, and I'm the president and CEO of the Adinkra Group. For the past five years, we've been bringing loads and loads of people to Ghana, many of them their first time on the African continent, their first time putting their toes in the African sand, in the African soil. And so many people have had their life changed. Our birthright journeys are curated cultural immersion journeys centered around reclaiming cultural identity, exploring your ancestral heritage, and celebrating African resilience. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our Birthright Journey Partner Program. It's really simple, and you really don't have to do much other than email us at info at theadinkergroup.com. Now, what makes a great Birthright Journey partner for our program? Are you a leader? Are you an influencer? Are you that person that your family calls on to organize, or do you automatically know that that's your job? Are you somebody of status in your community? Are you a community leader? Are you that person in your church or in the school? If you are, you are the ideal Birthright Journey partner. Do you believe that every person of African descent should have an opportunity to touch ground on the continent of Africa? If you are, then you are the ideal Birthright Journey partner. It's simple. We're going to show you how you can travel to Ghana for free. Not only can you travel to Ghana for free, but you can actually get paid to travel to Ghana. Really simple. Just contact us at info at and set up a discovery call. You'll get to travel. You'll get to travel with your family and friends. You'll get to travel with your community. And the best part of it is that it'll be free for you. Or you'll even earn money doing it. So again, info at theadinkergroup.com. We look forward to seeing you in Ghana. We look forward to dancing with you in Ghana. We look forward to eating fufu, eating jollof, eating wache. Uh -huh. Make sure you contact us now and we would love for you to become a Birthright Journey partner. Madasi. And we are back. Welcome back to Diaspora Link here exclusively on Ghana Web TV. I am here on this episode with my guest, Mr. Safiwe Baleka. Okay, so let's pick right up. So you are now an African. <laughs> let's just say it that way, right? You are now an African. You are um, in, back in Connecticut. You are working um, various nonprofits and doing different things. You know, did you have... So outside of your father, other, you have other family members or friends around? Were people like concerned, like, man, you went to Yale, you left, you know, two months before graduation, were people really concerned? And, and later on, did they come and say, oh, wow, well, he made some really um, strange or unusual choices, but he turned out, he still turned out to be okay. Did That's exactly what happened. At the time, my family was very concerned. You know, they didn't. They weren't with me at Yale, so they didn't, they weren't there to witness the changes. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand them. They didn't know anything about this Rastafari thing. So, yeah, they oh, were. Oh, y'all do a smoke weed. That's, that's what they that's thought. What, <laughs> um, that's, that's the going, the, the really the going thought about Rastafari, Rastafariism is that you just smoke weed. Yeah, but for me, it wasn't. For me, it was about studying Emperor Haile Selassie's um, plans for developing Ethiopia and rebuilding his country, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
so yeah, I made all of these different choices, which now my family's quite proud of the work that I've done, right. having taken, you know, started off on this traditional path, then gone on this very unconventional, unorthodox path, mm -hmm. um, and only to have um, accomplished things, I think, that um, they are proud of. And the, the, the real turning point was in 2003. And okay. I, don't, um, I don't know if people really, really understand the significance of this. It's, in some ways, it's even prophetic. But I think mm -hmm. in the future, this, this, this will be con the turning point. Two things happened in 2003. One, the African Union amended their constitution to include the diaspora okay. for the first time in officially building the continent. And two, I believe it's 2003 that African ancestry started. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. which is a new technology, a new tool that all of a sudden um, African diaspora people who for all these hundreds of years and generations mm -hmm. didn't know where they came from in Africa. Now we have a tool where we could find out exactly who we come from and where we come from in Africa and there is this sort of instrument at the African Union that will allow us, right, uh, as a way in. All of that happened in 2003, and it just so happened that the moment the African Union was making this invitation, I was the lone representative of the African diaspora at the African Union when this thing happened. Mm -hmm. And so... So you talked about African ancestry, mm -hmm. right, and being able to take your DNA test to find out where you're from. Um, did you, when did you take your test? I took my test in, I believe it was 2009 or 2010. Okay, but, all, but, but, but you remember African ancestry happening at that time, the same time as yes. the African Union. Okay, yes. so I was actually gonna say, okay, so now let's go back to you swimming in Ghana on this particular trip for Guinea-Bissau. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, how can a black man from Aurora, Illinois, <laughs> right? Yes. Who went to Yale and took Yale to the championship in their last year and also left school two months before graduating, grew locks, became a Rastafarian, right? Yes. Moved back to America. How can a black man like you with that history represent a sovereign country like Guinea-Bissau in the swim meet? So um, I took, I did my DNA test, okay. maternal and paternal. With African ancestry? With Afri African ancestry. With African ancestry, okay. And discovered that uh, on my paternal side, um, my sequence similarity showed that I was 100% the same, had the same genetic sequence as Balanta from Guinea-Bissau. The Balanta people Belanta from Guinea-Bissau. Okay, yes. from Guinea-Bissau. So. And your maternal? My maternal is Yoruba. Okay. Yeah. From? Nigeria. Okay, present day Nigeria. Gotcha. Um, now, uh, you know, I was raised by my father. Okay. It was just me and my father, mm -hmm. right? So I'm very close to my father's side. When I discovered I was my ancestry was Belanta. Of course, I want to find out as much as I can about it. And Belanta, never having had chiefs, leaders, established any kind of state structures or kingdoms, as a result, Western scholarship was not interested in Belanta because mm -hmm. there's this bias, this privilege that, you know, if you don't have state structures, you're not worthy of civilization. Mm -hmm. So it was very difficult to find information on Belanta. So me being a scholar and having that skill set, you know, I dug deep and everything I could find, I compiled mm -hmm. um, and published three books on Balanta history because I knew that other Balanta people like myself would want this information. Right, because if you took your DNA test and found out that you were Balanta, someone else exactly. also would have taken this. Okay, so you, you've written three books. What are the names of your books? It's called Balanta Barasa, My Sons. Okay. Those who resist remain. Okay. It's three volumes. Okay. And in the process of doing that, in a very, 
I wrote those three volumes in a year and a half. Okay. I had the financial security and the ability to work full time on that. It was very intense. So I was internalizing all of that information and I was reactivating my Balanta genetic code, so mm -hmm. to speak, mm -hmm. um, which really um, inspired me to now I must go to my ancestral homeland. And I did that. I was the f in January of 2020, uh, I came to Guinea-Bissau for the first time. Okay. And that made me the first person in my family since my fifth generation great-grandfather who was captured as a boy and brought from his homeland in Nakra, mm -hmm. Guinea-Bissau, or actually Unche, Guinea-Bissau to South Carolina. After 250 years, I was the first of my family to return. Wow. Of course, it was a very profound moment. Anybody mm -hmm. that, that undergoes a journey like that knows what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And during that visit, um, you know, I wanted to help other Balanta people make that connection. And that was the real sort of purpose of that visit. Right. But in the process of doing that, I actually met with the Minister of Sport, um, who knew about my swimming background. Um, I had come out of retirement and I was swimming what they call master's swimming, okay. which is for like older people that are swimming. Mm -hmm. um, and I had won four silver medals at the Masters World Swimming Championships. Okay. Um, so in meeting with the Minister of Sport, he was like, you know, how would you like to represent Guinea-Bissau in the Olympics? And I was like, <laughs> right, right, are you serious? That would, right. that, that would be like... Brought the, back an old dream. Yeah, that brought back an old dream. That would be a, one of the greatest honors. Now, by this point, you know, I'm, I'm not competitive enough that I could compete for a medal. Right. But at the same time, I was fast enough that I could compete. I wouldn't finish in last place. It wouldn't right. be an embarrassment. I would do Guinea-Bissau proud. Right. So we started that process. Um, in order to do that, though, I would need to be a Guinea-Bissau citizen. Right. So that's what started the citizenship process. Mm -hmm. And so um, eventually I did become a citizen of Guinea-Bissau. Okay. And not very different than there are other... Now from the first trip, because you said it was January 2020. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. So within the past year and a half, two years, you spent this time, you, you've gotten your citizenship. And, yes. Okay. Yes. And, you know, there are... Other members of this African ancestry family or movement, people that are finding out their DNA, mm -hmm. returning to the, their, their ancestral homelands, who are doing the work on the ground and meeting with their governments, their ministries of tourism, their ministries of foreign affairs, mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. department, um, to make a way for others to come back and those that need citizenship to do it. So I'm just putting it into in context. I'm just the one in Guinea-Bissau. No, no, no. I, you, look, this is, we real life on diaspora. Mm -hmm. So it's okay for them to know that I work with African ancestry. They don't. <laughs> yeah, no, but what, I, what I'm saying is in context, you yes. know, there are people that are returning to their countries in doing this work. I'm just the one who happens to be doing it in, in Guinea-Bissau. Guinea yes, There's yes, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Cameroon, Ghana, Cameroon. Every, yep. it's, it's happening across yep, Africa. Yep, yep. Um, so I feel you know, honored to be a part of it and making my contribution because Guinea-Bissau is a small country. It's only so, two so million. So talk to us a little bit because you know, most people, right? And I get your connection. You found out that you were from Guinea-Bissau. Yes from your paternal side. Yes. So there's a, a, a lot of things special about you and that most people who raise, or most black men who are raised by um, a single parent are not raised by their father. Exactly. The majority of, of, of black men who are raised by a single parent is raised by their mother. So you were raised by your father um, and you found out that you were from Guinea-Bissau and then you went there. Like there was something inside of you yes. that spoke to you about going back to Guinea-Bissau. So a lot of us don't know a lot about Guinea-Bissau. Can you tell us, just give us some general information about Guinea-Bissau. So um, I don't know what Guinea-Bissau was called before independence, right? Um, but the Balanta ancestors talked about 
Nakra and Mansoa as their their um, their homeland. Nakra and Mansoa. And, Mansoa. And, and I heard you say that your great 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 grandfather's from Onche was from. Did you say Nakra? village of Onche? Onche. Yeah. Okay. Now um, Guinea Bissau was colonized by the Portuguese, okay. who declared war uh, against that land June 18th, 1452, okay. in a document called the Dumb Diversus. So it's a 521-year war that was ended um, mm -hmm. when uh, Guinea-Bissau achieved independence September 24th, 1970, 1973. Okay. Okay. Wait a minute. Guinea Bissau just got their independence in 73? Yes. That's two years before I was born, man. Come on. All right, come on. <laughs> so um, perhaps the most famous um, person from Guinea Bissau that the diaspora would know is Amilcar Cabral, mm -hmm. um, a brilliant thinker, Pan Africanist, um, revolutionary who um, initiated and led an 11 year armed struggle where the people of Guinea-Bissau fought a war mm -hmm. to win their independence. Mm. It wasn't handed to them. Right. Um, and that has made Guinea-Bissau, I think, the mentality and in, in, in the way the country is uh, different than some other places. Mm -hmm. um, but Fighting a war might would do that to you. Yes. <laughs> Give you a different mentality. Now, um, Guinea-Bissau, again, it's a small country. Mm -hmm. Its population is about 2 million people. Okay. Capital is Bissau. Um, Which is about the population of Accra. I think Accra may be at 3, somewhere between 2 and 3 million. So the population of the whole country is, okay, I get it. Okay. Um, and Guinea-Bissau has uh, these islands that are beautiful with beautiful beaches. So if, if, if you wanted to go someplace in Africa and visit beautiful, pristine beaches, you know, mm -hmm. there is that aspect of tourism there. But for the most part, Guinea-Bissau um, doesn't have much of a connection with Afro-descendants from the United States. Mm -hmm. um, their connection is through these Portuguese networks. So within Africa, you're talking Angola, Mozambique, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then on the other side of the Atlantic, you're talking mostly Brazil, um, and then some of the Caribbean countries. So, so the connections are stronger with those other Portuguese-speaking yes. places more than they are directly with the U.S., for example. Yes. Okay. So um, as a result of the work that I started doing in Guinea-Bissau, this is really the first time that Guinea-Bissau is now having a connection with Afro-descendant people in the United States, you know, who are English speakers. Wow. So we, we, before, before we finish, because we're, we're, our time is um, getting close to the end, talk to us specifically about this decade of return program that you're working with the country of Guinea-Bissau. So the decade of return is just what it is. It's a program for the next 10 years to... Um, invite, encourage, market to, get diasporans, all diasporans, but particularly those that have taken a test and who have ancestry uh, from Guinea-Bissau to come to return home. Um, we've studied um, the year of return here in Ghana mm -hmm. um, to, to learn from it what was done correctly, what could have been done better, mm -hmm. um, and are applying those things into the Guinea-Bissau context. So we've already had two groups come this year. Our third yes. group is coming um, in November 23rd through the 30th. And are each of your groups eligible and or able to gain citizenship during their visit? So you, as you know, citizenship is not an automatic thing. You right, don't, right, you, right, you right, don't right, do, right. okay, I'm from here, so give me citizenship. Right, but is this something that they can start applying for through you guys before yes. they get there and maybe while they're there, culminate in a ceremony or something like that? Yes, that's exactly the program that we're putting together okay. um, for November. And okay. um, we expect that this November group, it, it, um, it will be our first citizenship confer conferment uh, ceremony. We hope to have our first, you know, Beautiful. following after Ghana and Sierra Leone. We hope to be the next country to do that. And, Beautiful. Um, really looking forward to it. Beautiful. So if someone else um, 
who wanted to go to another country? Because I get these questions a lot. Like, mm -hmm. And I'm like, I should just write a book called How to Make Moves in Africa, right? <laughs> because people are always like, yo, how did you, like, bro, you just, you showed up there, and the next thing I know, bam, 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 bam. What advice would you share or give to someone who, beyond just visiting, you know, like, what advice do you have for a returnee, for any African country, just from your experience from being in Ethiopia, South Africa, and all the places, things you've done, what piece of advice would you give to a returnee, specifically a victim of the transatlantic slave trade or somebody who would be considered a descendant um, of an enslaved African? One or two pieces of advice that you would give them in their approach to returning. Great question. I would say the most important thing is build a relationship with um, people from the area that you want to go to first. Mm -hmm. And I would say the best, the best way to do that is to take the DNA test and find out what your maternal, paternal lineage is. There are many DNA tests. This is not a commercial, but I'm, for me personally, I'd say take African Ancestry DNA test mm -hmm. and find out who you come from. And once you do that, you want to connect with others that have that same test result right. and use those networks to build a relationship with that community, right? So on that, the ground. On the ground the in, in that country. So mm -hmm. that when you, when you have the opportunity to come to that country, right, you will, you will be part of a family Right, and you will have a network there that will receive you and embrace you, not as a tourist, but as mm -hmm. one of your, like truly a brother or Ex sister, ex extended, extended cousin and extended family yes. member coming to visit. Um, to me, that has made all the difference in the world because I've traveled to many countries in Africa before having mm -hmm. made that, and my experiences were very much different. Going to Guinea-Bissau, having already connected with my Balanta people in Guinea-Bissau, changed everything. Mm -hmm. So that's the number one thing I would say is try to make that connection. And there are many ways to do that because you have all of these different networks and organizations right. mm -hmm. now that are mm -hmm. popping up in the United States specifically for each ethnic group that has those networks. Right. Last question. Um, what advice or what piece of advice would you give for our fellow continental African brothers and sisters in Guinea-Bissau and Ghana and Nigeria and Guinea, <clears throat> what piece of advice would you give to them um, for how they could better connect and receive us as we return? So I would say <clears throat> the more you learn about what we suffered in the transatlantic slave trade and how there, we were cut off from our lineages um, and we were cut off from our culture and spirituality and that we are trying to regain those things. What I would say is the more you learn about that, the more you will realize that when we come here, especially for the first time, honor that and respect that and don't just be trying to get money from us, okay? Mm -hmm. If I'm going to Elmina, which is a very profound, and experience, uh, uh, um, a profound experience for me and a very spiritual experience, when I get out of the taxi or the car, to be bombarded with everyone trying to get money from me is not how it should be. Remember that if we have a good experience here in Africa and we feel fulfilled spiritually and we want to come back and keep coming back the economic development will come naturally mm -hmm. but quite often the perception could be that you really don't care about us as brothers and sisters you're just looking to get money from us remember we are not the same as white Americans mm -hmm. there's a, a racial wealth gap in America for most of us that are coming we spend years saving enough money to buy a plane ticket, be able to afford to stay in a hotel mm -hmm. and eat. And by the time we're done with that, we don't have much money left mm -hmm. over, right? For, Some of us, yeah, 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 no, very true. You know, this is, this is like our lifelong dream to just go to Africa one time. And I don't know that um, the Africans here on the continent really understand what it takes for us to, to just get, get just here. To get here. 
Mm -hmm. So we understand that, yes, our condition, our material condition in America, right, is way better in, in, a, in many regards mm -hmm. than it is here. And yes, we understand you need the economic opportunities, but that can't be the primary focus of our relationship. Right. So Fiwe, we want to thank you so much for coming in for sharing with us, for squeezing us in your calendar. I'm so glad that we've been able to connect while you were in Ghana for this short time. Um, congratulations on your, on, on your swim meet here, um, on being as old as you are and still living your passion, still swimming. And you probably are, you, you could very well be like the first African American to represent an African country yes. in some kind of, you know, competitive, uh, sports meet. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, yes. Again, thank you so much. We loved your story. We, I loved having this conversation. You know, this is not the first conversation <laughs> we've had, and this won't be the last. For yes. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Safiwe Baleka on Diaspora Link exclusively on Ghana Web TV. We hope you all enjoyed this episode of Diaspora Link, exclusively on Ghana Web TV, with me, your host, Diallo Sumbri, and our guest today, Mr. Safiwe Baleka from Guinea-Bissau. We hope that you got a lot from this interview and this conversation today about his journey, about where he came from, where he started, and what he's doing now. We'll leave you today, as we do every week, with some ancestral wisdom by way of proverb. Today's proverb is, having a good discussion is like having riches. I'll say that one more time. Having a good discussion is like having riches. We hope you take that with you, that you think about it, and you discuss it with your loved ones and those close to you. Again, thank you for joining us this week on Diaspora Link, exclusively on Ghana Web TV, and we'll see you next episode.